from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to the Cube studio here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. We're here introducing a new format for Cube panel discussions. It's called Around the Cube, and we have a special segment here called Get Smart, unpacking AI with some great guests in the industry. Gene Santos, professor of engineering in college, engineering Dartmouth College, Bob Friday, vice president CTO at MIST at Juniper Company, and Ed Henry, senior scientist and distinguished member of the technical staff for machine learning at Dell EMC. Guys, this is a, a format we're going to keep score and we're going to throw out some interesting conversations around unpacking AI. Thanks for joining us here. Appreciate your time. Yeah, I'd be here. Okay, first question, as we all know, AI is on the rise. We're seeing AI everywhere. You can't go to a show or see marketing literature from any company, whether it's consumer or tech company around, they have all have AI, AI something. So AI is on the rise. The question is, is it real AI? Is AI relevant from a reality standpoint? What really is going on with AI? Gene, is AI real? I think a good chunk of AI is real there. It depends on what you apply it to. If it's making some sort of decisions for you, that is AI that's going into play. But there's also a lot of AI that's out there potentially is just simply a script. So you know, one of the challenges that you always have is that if it's sort of scripted, is it scripted because somebody's already developed the AI and now just uh, pulled out all the answers and just using the answers straight? Or is it actually learning and changing on its own? I would tend to say that anything that's learning and changing on its own, that's where you're having the evolving AI and that's where you get the most power from. Bob, what's your take on this? AI real? Yeah, and if you look at Google and the world, you, what you see is AI really became real in 2014. That's when AI and ML really became a, a thing in the industry. And when you look why did it become a thing in 2014, it's really back when we actually saw TensorFlow open source technology really become available. It's all that uh, Amazon uh, compute story. You know, you look what we're doing here at MIST, really, I really don't have to worry about compute storage except for the Amazon bill I get every month now. Uh, so I think you're really seeing AI become real because of some key turning points in the industry. Ed, your take, AI real? Yeah, um, so it depends on what lens you want to kind of look at it through. Um, the notion of intelligence is something that's kind of ill-defined um, and depending on how you want to interpret that uh, will kind of guide whether or not you think it's real. I tend to call things AI if it has a notion of agency. So if it can navigate its problem space without human intervention. Um, so really it depends on, uh, again, what lens you kind of want to look at it through. It's a set of moving goalposts, right? If you took your smartphone back to Turing when he was coming up with the Turing test and asked him if this intelligent for some value of intelligent device was AI, would that be AI to him probably back then? Um, so really it depends on how you kind of want to look at it. Is AI the same as it was in 1988 or has it changed? What's the change point with AI? Because some are saying AI has been around for a while but there's more AI now than ever before. Ed, we'll start with you. What's different with AI now versus say uh, in the late 80s, early 90s? See, what's funny is some of the methods that we're using aren't different. Um, I think the big push that's happened in the last decade or so has been the ability to store as much data as we can along with the ability to have as much compute readily disposable as we have today. Um, some of the methodologies, I mean, there was a great Wired article that was published and somebody referenced something called method called eigenvector decomposition. They said it was from quantum mechanics that came out in 1888, right? So it really, a lot of the, the methodologies that we're using aren't much different. It's the amount of data that we have available to us that represents reality and the amount of compute that we have. Bob. Yeah, so I mean, for me, right, back in the 80s when I did my masters, I actually did a masters on neural networks. Uh, so yeah, it's been around for a while. But when I started MIST, what really changed a couple of things. One is this modern cloud stack, right? So if you're going to have to build an AI solution, you really have to have all the pieces to ingest tons of data and process it in real time. So that is one big thing that's changed that we didn't have 20 years ago. Uh, the other big thing is we have access to all this open source TensorFlow stuff right now. You know, people like Google and Facebook have made it so easy for the average person to actually do an AI project, right? You know, anyone here, anyone in the audience here could actually train a machine learning model over the weekend right now. You just have to go to Google. You have to find kind of the, you know, they have the data sets. You want to basically build a model to recognize letters and numbers. Those data sets are on the internet right now. 
and you personally yourself could go become a data scientist over the weekend. Gene, your take. Yeah, I think also on top of that, because of all that availability on the open software, anybody can come in and start playing with AI. It's also building a really large experience space of what works and what doesn't work. And because they have that, now you can actually better define the problem that you're shooting for. And when you do that, you increase, you know, what's going to work, what's not going to work. And people can also tell you this is that on the part that's not going to work, how is it going to expand? But I think overall, though, uh, this comes back to the question of when people ask, what is AI? And a lot of that is just being focused on machine learning. And if it's just machine learning, that's kind of a, a little limited use in terms of, you know, what you're classifying or not. You know, back in the early 80s, AI uh, back then is really what people are trying to call artificial general intelligence nowadays, but it's that all-encompassing piece of all the things that, you know, us humans can do, us humans can reason about, uh, all the decision sequences that we make. And so, you know, that's, that's the part that we haven't quite gotten to, but there is, you know, all, all the things that that's why of uh, the applications that the AI with the machine learning classification has gotten us this far. Okay, machine learning is certainly relevant. It's been one of the most hottest, the hottest topic, I think, in computer science. And with AI becoming much more democratized, you guys mentioned TensorFlow, a variety of other open source niches, it's been a great wave of innovation. And again, motivation, younger generations, it's e easier to code now than ever before. Uh, but machine learning seems to be at the heart of AI. Uh, and there's really two schools of thoughts in the machine learning world. Is it just math or is there more of a cognition learning machine kind of thing going on? This has been a big debate in the industry. I want to get your guys' take on this, Gene. Um, is machine learning just math and running algorithms or is, it, is there more to it like cognition? Where do, you, where do you guys fall on this? What's real? Uh, if I look at the applications and look at what people are using it for, it's mostly just algorithms. It's mostly that, you know, you've managed to do the pattern recognition. You've managed to compute out the things and find something interesting from it. But then on the other side, you know, the folks working in say neural, neurosciences, the first people working in cognitive sciences, you know, I have the interest in saying that when we look at that, that machine learning, does it correspond to what we're doing as human beings? Now, because the reason I fall more on the algorithm side is that a lot of those algorithms, they don't match what we're often thinking. So if they're not matching that, uh, it's like, okay, something else is coming up, but then what do we do with it? You know, you can get an answer and work from it, but then if we want to build true human intelligence, how does that all stack together to get to the human intelligence? And I think that's the uh, challenge at this point. Bob, machine learning, math, cognition, is there more to do there? What's your take? Yeah, I think right now you look at machine learning, machine learning are the algorithms we use. I mean, I think the big thing that happened in machine learning is the neural network and the deep learning. That was kind of a, a mild stepping stone where we got to and actually building kind of these AI behavior things. You know, when you look what's really happening out there, you know, you look at the self-driving car, what we don't realize is like, it's kind of scary right now. If you go to Vegas, you can actually get on a self-driving bus now. You know, so this AI machine learning stuff is starting to happen right before our eyes. You know, when you go to the healthcare now and you get your diagnosis for cancer, right? We're starting to see AI and image recognition really start to change, you know, how we get our diagnosis, you know, and that's really starting to affect, you know, people's lives, you know, so those are cases where we're starting to see this AI machine learning stuff is starting to make a difference. Uh, when we think about the AI singularity discussion, right? You know, when are we finally going to build something that really has human, uh, behavior. I mean, right now we're building AI that can actually play Jeopardy, right? Uh, and that was kind of one of the inspirations for the, my, my company missed, right? Was, hey, if they can build stuff to play Jeopardy, we should be able to build something to answer questions on par with network domain experts. Uh, so I think we're seeing people build solutions now that do a lot of behaviors that uh, mimic humans. Um, I do think we're probably on the path to building something that is truly going to be on uh, par with uh, human thinking, right? You know, whether it's 50 years or a thousand years, I think it's inevitable on how man is progressing right now. If you look at the technological exponential growth we're seeing in human evolution. Well, we're going to get to that in the next question. So you jump ahead, hold that thought. Ed, machine learning, just math, pattern recognition, or is there more cognition there to, to be had? Where, is it, where do you fall on this? Um, right now it's, it's, I mean, it's all math. Um, so we collect something some data set about the world, and then we use algorithms and some representation of mathematics to find some pattern, which is new and interesting, don't get me wrong. 
Um, when you say the word cognition, though, we have to understand that we have a fundamentally flawed v uh, like perspective on how maybe the one like uh, uh, guiding light that we have on what intelligence could be would be ourselves, right? Computers don't work like brains. Brains are what we've determined our uh, embody our intelligence, right? Computers, our brains don't have a clock. There's no state that's actually uh, kept between different clock cycles inside of the brain. So when you start using words like cognition, we end up trying to measure ourselves or use ourselves as a ruler. And most of the methodologies that we have today don't necessarily head down that path. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I view it. Yeah, I mean, state, stateless, those are API kind of mindsets. You can't run <laughs> Kubernetes in the brain. Maybe we will in the future. Um, stateful applications are always harder than stateless as we all know. But again, when I'm sleeping, I'm still dreaming. So cognition and the question of human replacement. This has been a huge conversation. This is one, the singularity conversation, you know, the fear of most average people and then some technical people as well on the, on the job front. Will AI replace my job? Will it take over the world? Is there going to be a Skynet Terminator moment? This is a big conversation point because it just teases out what could be and tech for good, tech for bad, some say tech is neutral, but it can be shaped. So the question is, will AI replace humans and where does that line come from? Uh, we'll start with uh, Ed on this one. What is, where do you see this singularity discussion where humans are going to be replaced with AI? So replace is an interesting term. Um, so there, if, I mean, you look at the last kind of industrial revolution that happened and people are, I think are most worried about the potential of job loss. And when you look at what happened during the Industrial Revolution, this concept of creative destruction kind of came about. And the idea is that, yes, technology has taken some jobs out of the market in some way, shape, or form, but more jobs were created because of that technology. So it's kind of our one, again, lighthouse that we have with respect to measuring that. Singularity in and of itself, again, the ill-defined definition of intel or the ill-defined notion of intelligence that we have today I mean, when you go back and you read some of the early papers from psychologists from the early 1900s, uh, the, the Spearman specifically who came up with this idea of intelligence, he uses the term uh, general intelligence as kind of like the first time that all of civilization has like tried to assign a definition to what this is of intelligence, right? And it's only been roughly a hundred years or so since, or maybe a little longer since we've had this kind of understanding that's been normalized, at least within Western culture of what this notion of intelligence is. So singularity, this idea of the singularity is interesting because we, we just don't understand enough about the one measure ruler or yardstick that we have that we consider intelligence ourselves to be able to go in and then embed that inside of a thing. Gene, what's your thoughts on this? Um, reasoning is a big part of your research. You're doing a lot of research around intent and contextual, all these cool behavioral things. You know, this is where machines are there to augment or replace. This is the conversation, your view on this. I think one of the things is this, is that that's where the challenge still lies. If we have bad intentions and we can actually start communicating, then we can start hitting the general intelligence. I mean, sort of like what Ed was referring to, how people have been trying to define this. But I think one of the, the problems that comes up is that mm -hmm. computers and stuff like that don't really capture that at this time. They, the, the intentions that they have are still at a low level. But if we start tying it to you know, the question of the Terminator moment, to the singularity, uh, one of the things is that uh, autonomy, you know, how much autonomy that we give to the algorithm, how much does the algorithm has access to? Now, there could be, you know, just, just to be on extreme, there could be a disaster situation where, you know, we weren't very careful and we provided an API that actually gives full autonomy uh, to whatever AI we have to run it. And so you can start seeing elements of Skynet that can come from that. But I also tend to come down and say that, hey, even with APIs, while it's not AI, APIs, uh, a lot of that also, you have the intentions of what you're going to give it to control. Then you have the AI itself, where if you've defined the intentions of what it is supposed to do, then you can avoid that terminator moment in terms of that's more of an act. So I'm seeing it at this point. And so overall singularity, I still think we're a ways off. And you know, when people worry about job loss, probably the closest thing that I think that can match that in recent history is the whole thing on automation. Uh, I grew up at the at the time uh, in Ohio when the steel industry was collapsing, and that was a trade-off between automation and what the current jobs are. And if you have something like that, okay, uh, that's one thing that we go forward dealing with. And I think this is something that uh, state governments or national governments something we should be considering. 
you know, if you're going to have that job loss, you know, what better study, what better form can you do from that? And I've heard different proposals from different people like, well, if we need to retrain people, where do you get the resources from? It could be something even like AI job tech. And so there, there's a lot of things to discuss. We're not there yet, but I do believe that the, the lower repetitive jobs out there, uh, 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 of, uh, how should I say, uh, the, the things where we can easily define, those could be replaceable, but that's still close to the automation side. Yeah, and there's a lot of opportunities there. Bob, you mentioned uh, in the last segment, the, uh, the singularity, cognition, learning machines, you mentioned deep, link, deep learning. As the machines learn, this is, needs more data, data informs if it's uh, biased data or real data, how do you become cognitive? How do you become human if you don't have the data or the algorithms? The data is the data. Well, I mean, and I think that's one of the big ethical debates going on right now, right? You know, are we basically going to basically take our human biases and train them into our next generation of AI devices, right? Um, but I think from my point of view, I think it's inevitable that we will build something as complex as the brain eventually. Uh, don't know if it's 50 years or 500 years from now, uh, but if you look at kind of the evolution of man where we've been over the last 100,000 years or so, uh, you kind of see this exponential rise in technology, right? From, you know, for thousands of years, our technology was relatively flat. It's only been the last 200 years where we've seen this exponential growth in technology that's taking off. And, you know, what's amazing is when you look at quantum computing, uh, what's scary is I always thought it was quantum computing being a research lab thing, but when you start to see VCs investing in quantum computing startups, um, you know, we're going from university research discussions to yes, we're trying to commercialize quantum computing. You know, when you look at the complexity of what a brain does, um, it's inevitable that we will build something that has basically complexity of a neuron. And I think, you know, if you look how people, you know, neuroscience looks at the brain, uh, we really don't understand how it encodes, but it's clear that it does encode memories, uh, which is very similar to what we're doing right now with our AI machine, right? We're building things that takes data and memories and encodes it in some certain way. Uh, so, yeah, and I'm, I'm convinced that we will start to see more AI uh, cognizance start to really happen as we start the, for the next hundred years. Guys, this is a really great conversation. Um, AI is real based upon this around the cube conversation. Look at, I mean, you're seeing the, the, the evidence there. You guys pointed it out and, you, and I think Cloud computing has been a real accelerant with the combination of machine learning and open source as you guys have illustrated. And so that brings up the kind of the final question I'd love to get each of your thoughts on this because Bob just brought up quantum computing, which as the race to quantum supremacy goes on around the world, this becomes maybe that next step function, kind of what cloud computing did for re, re, revitalizing or creating a renaissance in AI. What does quantum do? I mean, so that begs the question, five, 10 years out, if machine learning is the beginning of it and it starts to, to solve some of these problems as quantum comes in more compute, unlimited resource applied with software, where does that go five, 10 years? We'll go start with Gene, Bob, then Ed, let's wrap this up. Yeah, I think if quantum becomes a reality that, you know, when you, know, when you have the exponential growth, this is going to be exponential and exponential. Quantum is going to address a lot of the harder AI problems that were from complexity. You know, when you talk about just regular search, uh, regular uh, approaches of looking up stuff, quantum is the one that allows you now to take the, potentially take something that was exponential and make it quantum. And so that's going to be a big driver. That'll be a, a big enabler where, you know, a lot of the problems I look at trying to do intentions is that I have an exponential number of tensions, intentions that might be possible if I'm going to choose as an explanation, but quantum will allow me to narrow it down to one if that technology can work out. And of course, you know, the real challenge that if I could rephrase it into say a quantum program on doing it, but that's, that, I think the advance is just beyond a step function. So beyond a step means. function you yeah. see. Okay, Bob, your, your yeah. take on this, because you brought it up, quantum, step function, revolution. What's your view on this? I mean, it's quantum, quantum, quantum computing changes the whole paradigm, right? Because it kind of goes from a paradigm of what we, you know, this binary, if this, then that type of computing. Um, so I think quantum computing is like more than just a step function. Uh, I think it's going to take a whole paradigm shift of, you know, it's going to be another decade or two before we actually get all the tools we need to actually start leveraging quantum, quantum computing. Uh, but I think that is going to be one of those 
step function is that basically takes our AI efforts into a whole different realm, right? And it'll let us solve another whole set of class of problems. Uh, and that's why they're doing it right now, because it starts to be able to let you crack all the encryption codes, right? You know, where you have millions or billions of choices, and you have to basically find that one needle in the haystack. Uh, so quantum computing is going to basically open that piece of the puzzle up. And when you look at these AI solutions, it's really a collection of different things going underneath the uh, underneath the hood, right? It's not just one algorithm that you're doing and trying to mimic human behavior. Um, so quantum computing is going to be yet one more tool in the AI toolbox that's going to move the whole thing, well, move the whole industry forward. Ed, you're up. Quantum. Cool. Um, so yeah. So I think it'll it'll like uh, Dean and Bob had alluded to, fundamentally change the way we approach these problems. Um, and the reason is combinatorial problems that everybody's talking about. So if I want to evaluate the state space of anything uh, using modern uh, binary based computers, we have to kind of iteratively make that search over that search space where quantum computing allows you to kind of evaluate the entire search space at once. When you talk about like games like AlphaGo, you talk about having more moves on a blank 19 by 19 AlphaGo board than you have if you put a thousand universes on every proton of our universe. So the state space is absolutely massive. So searching that is impossible using today's binary based computers, but quantum computing allows you to uh, evaluate kind of search spaces like that in one big chunk to, to really simplify the, the aspect. But I think it will kind of change how we approach these problems to Bob and Gene's point um, with respect to uh, how we approach the technology. Once we crack that quantum nut, I don't think we'll look anything like what we have today. Okay, here we go. Thank you guys. Looks like we have a winner. Bob, you're up by one point. We got a tie for second between Ed and Gene. Um, of course, I'm the arbiter, but I decided, yeah. Bob, you nailed this one. So <laughs> since you're the winner, uh, Gene, you guys did a great job coming in second place. Ed, good job. Bob, you get the last word. Unpacking AI, what's the summary from your perspective as the winner of Around the Cube? Yeah, no, I, I think you know from a societal point of view, I think it, uh, AI is going to be on par with kind of the internet. It's going to be one of these next big technology things. Um, I think it's starting to impact our lives and people, when you look around it, it's kind of sneaking up on us, you know, whether it's the self-driving car, or the healthcare cancer, or the self-driving bus. Uh, so I think it's here. I think we're just at the beginnings of it. Um, and I think it's going to be one of these technologies that's going to basically impact our lives over the next you know, one or two decades, next 10, 20 years, is just going to be exponentially growing uh, everywhere in all our segments. Thanks so much for uh, playing, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have an inventor, entrepreneur, Gene, doing great research at Dartmouth. Uh, check him out. Um, Gene Santos at Dartmouth Computer Science and Ed, technical uh, genius at Dell, figuring out how to make those machines smarter. And with the software abstractions growing, uh, you guys are doing some good work over there as well. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us on this inaugural Around the Cube, uh, Unpacking AI, Get Smart series. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's a wrap everyone. This is theCUBE in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.